welcome to Citizens Forum. My name's Will Smith, and we're recording this show on Wednesday, February 13th, 2019. I'd like to thank the Shaw staff and our wonderful group of volunteers for making this show possible. Today, my guest is Captain Duke Snyder, and he's going to be telling us about polar ice navigation. And he's not only going to tell us about this today, but he's also giving a talk uh, later on in the month. So if you really want to find out more about this subject and ask him some questions, you can continue on from here by coming to his talk at Odd Fellows, which will occur later on. Is it later? Is yeah, it early in March? Early March. Okay. So welcome to the show, Duke. And uh, can you tell us uh, how long have you been doing this polar ice navigation? Well, it's uh, been almost 35 years, I guess, by now. I, I started in the 1980s uh, on the Mackenzie River on a Coast Guard uh, buoy tender and graduated from that into various ice-breaking ships and uh, cargo ships in both the, the Canadian Arctic and uh, down into the Antarctic. And this is with the Canadian Navy, right? No, uh, uh, Canadian Coast Guard. Oh, Coast Guard. Uh, uh, the Canadian Coast Guard runs the fleet of ice-breakers and ice-breaking ships for the, the Government of Canada. But uh, my career is also uh, in, uh, entailed operating on ice-breaking cargo ships, including MV Arctic, which was at the time the, the highest ice-class cargo ship in the world. Uh, I've done uh, consulting work with uh, companies operating or wishing to operate in the Antarctic and, Antarctic and been asked to uh, sail on the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Polar Star into the Antarctic to review their training methods. and. Uh, bring them up to uh, an international standard. Well, that's very interesting. So you you are retired from the Coast Guard, but you have your own company now, right? That I am. Uh, after 30 odd years in the Coast Guard, uh, I retired from only from Coast Guard. I didn't retire from the working world. My own company, Martech Polar, uh, now provides uh, ice navigators uh, throughout the polar regions, both Antarctic and Antarctic. We've got about 25 team members. Uh, we've got two in the Antarctic right now, and uh, our busiest season is, is truly the uh, North American summer with Arctic operations. So, the North American summer when you have to go through the ice, but it's uh, but it's fairly clear now, right? Or in the in the well, summer. that's uh, what I want to know about. I want to know about what you see up there that's different. <laughs> that that's uh, certainly one of the things I'm going to be talking about uh, at the Odd Fellows in, in early March is uh, some of the myths and realities of, of polar shipping and the the, the polar climates are, are definitely changing. There there is no doubt from what, what I've seen, what I you know our people see, what, what polar shipping sees that um, global climate change is real. Um, there, there's no mystery about it. Uh, the, there is less ice in general. Um, the seasons for relatively open water shipping in both the uh, Arctic and the Antarctic are getting gradually longer, um, you know, a few days more a year. Um, the ice in general is, is much more thinner than, than in past decades, um, but that in itself causes its own risks. And, and the concept of an ice-free summer uh, that you often see uh, touted in, in uh, popular press is not the reality. Okay. Uh, in fact, this past summer, a uh, number of ships were stopped from going through the Northwest Passage by heavy ice because ice, sea ice is variable. One, one day it's good, one day it's bad. It changes daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly. And it also has cycles. And, and the interesting thing that, that we've seen in, in the polar shipping industry is the, the cycles that we've known about, 11-year cycles from a good ice year, which is a year with little ice, to a bad ice year, and 50-year cycles, historical cycles. Um, we can chart those, um, but underlying that is that gradual reduction in overall ice. So that the massive ice that exists from year to year is less than ever before. So we're able to go longer with uh, lighter ice class ships mm -hmm. uh, and go up earlier. What other changes do you see? Is there anything else notable besides just the, the ice or do well, it's weather in general? Or? Weather and the ice and the weather go hand in hand. They're, they're, they're part of the same ecosystem. Right. Uh, and uh, certainly when you've got a, an area that had previously been ice covered throughout the, the season, 
when it opens up, there is a possibility for higher storm events, greater storm events. Uh, in fact, uh, the last operation I did uh, in 2018 was on the Japanese research ship Mirai. Uh, the voyage was intentionally planned to operate from November through December uh, in the, uh, the Chukchi Sea in the, the western North American Arctic in between Alaska and Russia. The reason the ship was there for that period of time was because the area has become more open much longer and massive storm events are occurring that never occurred before. Oh, interesting. They are impacting <coughs> on coastal communities as well as continental communities. When we look at the weather that we've had over the last week and, and people decry, well, how can it be polar warming when we've got colder temperatures across North America? That's part of the global warming cycle. Those wow. colder temperatures the movement uh, southward of the polar vortex impact is enabled by the global changes. And we are seeing those in the north amplified a hundredfold. Uh, in areas where there was previously um, heavy ice to two meters thick, uh, we were there with the RV Mirai, Mirai and saw no ice whatsoever, which was quite a shocker for everyone on the ship. So what about uh can you contrast that with the Antarctic? Is it pretty much the same? Interesting in the Antarctic, uh, up until the very recent past, there was a, a, a bit of a counter to that. It, it seemed that there was a, a longer ice season growing, but over the last few years, that has shifted. And I think that, uh, again, comes into the whole climate change thing. As the ocean currents are, are, are shifting and moving because of the overall increase in the, the atmospheric temperatures, we're, we're seeing more warming events now in the Antarctic as well. In particular, a massive change to the flow of the Antarctic glaciers. The Antarctic is a glacier-covered continent, mm -hmm. and massive, what had been previously um, stable ice fields, the Ross Ice Shelf, are fracturing and calving off these massive icebergs that we would never have seen in the past. Uh, the amount of melt in Antarctica is causing fresh water to increase the movement of the glaciers underneath them, and it's causing fresh water to change the, uh, the, the freeze up in the annual sea ice change. So it, it's happening on both sides, but a little bit differently, whether it's in the north and the south. Do you have anything uh, you want to tell us to look for in particular that you've thought about? Or <laughs> well, I, the one thing I want to get across to people is, you know, we, we've got to get away from the hyperbole around this. Um, it's not ice-free summers in the, the Antarctic or the Arctic. Um, the, the conditions are changing. Um, they're changing dramatically, uh, but there is still a great risk to shipping to the communities there. It's not like it's going to be the tropics up there anytime soon. Right. Uh, okay. My whole uh, purpose is to make sure ships get from point A to point B in the ice. They still need people experienced in ice navigation um, because you will still encounter ice. Uh, and it's not going to be this thing where you can suddenly depart Victoria in your, in your yacht and go through the Northwest Passage and write a book about it, you're bound to come to grief if you go that uh, ill-prepared. Okay. Well, let's uh, take a look at, you've written this book, and uh, you were telling me that it's uh, a second edition yes, that's been updated because of some changes. And you want to tell us about those? That sounds very interesting. Absolutely. The, the first uh, edition of the book came out in uh, 2012. Uh, it's uh, the first um, practical manual for uh, ship operators operating in both the polar regions um, because they are so different from operating a ship or uh, even a yacht. Um, and uh, it's been recommended for uh, expedition uh, ships as, as well as commercial shipping. But in uh, 2016, uh, the International Maritime Organization, the, IM the IMO, which is uh, a part of the uh, UN, and it governs international shipping regulations. In 2016, the Polar Code uh, was brought into force, and that is the first mandatory international foundation of regulation for shipping. So for the first time in the history of shipping globally, 
uh, any ships uh, that are trading internationally over 500 tons uh, um, are required to meet these regulations in both construction and outfitting and training. And uh, I uh, participated in the development of that uh, as the Nautical Institute's um, delegate to IMO to ensure that people are properly trained on ships going into the, uh, the Arctic and the Antarctic as well as the ships are properly outfitted. And it's now coming into effect um, the ships, uh, new ships built after uh, 2016 have had to been built to the new standards. Existing ships um, such as the Polar Star or even our, our uh, local ships going up into the Canadian Arctic will be required to, to comply with the regulations within the next couple of years. So it's big changes. Okay. So who would, who would be uh, interested in getting a copy of this book? Would it, is it only for people who actually sail ships or? Um, no, actually, uh, I think this would be uh, interesting to, to anyone who has an interest in uh, the marine environment. Um, it is not just about shipping. It, it gives uh, a basis of the geography of the poles, the, some of the climatology, some of the meteorology, uh, and, and some basic uh, understanding of that, and then, then goes into the meat of operating ships. Um, Managers of operators uh, and people interested uh, in the polls, I think, would find this a, a fun read. It's not meant as a, a technological, um, boring book. It, it's right. meant to inform. Okay. And how about your on your talk? Would you? What kind of uh, people who are not just pilots, or but other anybody who's interested in marine, uh, what's going on, right? Absolutely. Anybody that's interested in what's going on, particularly in the, the, the Arctic, I'll focus uh, the odd fellows on um, the myths and realities of um, what's occurring in the Arctic. It will be focused uh, on shipping, uh, which is my expertise, but it's what's happening throughout the Arctic that affects shipping. So it, it, it could be interesting to anyone who has a concern for what's going on. Uh, on our very shores, and Canada being uh, really the second largest Arctic country in the world. It, it impacts us all. Okay, great. Well, I'll put a, a page up with the information on your talk, sure, and uh, we're out of time. Uh, thank you very much for coming onto the show and telling us about this. I think it's really fascinating, and I'm always especially interested in hearing people who have actually seen things and experienced them rather than you know, it just it's easy to look at data and make up anything. So thank you very much. Thank you, Will. It's been a pleasure being here. And thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.